This video is brought to you by Squarespace. If you need a website or domain, check out squarespace.com. Hey everybody, and welcome to a new video. Do you find it difficult to get good photos in bright sunlight? Do your photos look washed out or have clipped highlights? I know all about it. I went to Kenya on a photo safari recently and the bright sun made photography really challenging. In this video, I'm gonna show you what techniques I used in the field to get photos like these under the scorching sun and my processing tricks to salvage them from harsh conditions. And while I shoot wildlife, these tips will apply to many other genres of photography. I'll also show you some shots taken with a new Canon RF 200 to 800 that Canon lent me for the trip too, along with my thoughts. And hang around for my bonus tip where I'll show you the processing trick to get from this to this. My name is Simon Dantremont and I'm a professional nature and wildlife photographer living in Eastern Canada. I make weekly videos giving you photo tips or taking you behind the scenes for wildlife and nature photography. Subscribe if you want to see more. My recent trip to Kenya was amazing, but it sure does push your limits in photography. The sun rises straight up in no time and you go from shooting in the dark to the light of what feels like a thousand suns in a flash. In that middle part of generous but not too harsh light of the golden hour, photography is relatively easy, but the before and after are brutal. Last week's video was about shooting in the dark conditions before sunrise and after sunset, like this shot. You can check that out here, but this video is on the opposite, shooting under the blazing sun. The golden hour there, right after sunrise and before sunset, hardly felt like an hour, and while I might pack up and go home when the sun reaches above, let's say, 20 degrees above the horizon when I'm back home, if I've traveled halfway around the world to take photos, I'm not packing up that quickly. So I needed to make the best of it. Here are five scenarios that I faced and the techniques I used to salvage photos taken in the harsh, full sun of Kenya. Problem number one in shooting in harsh light is having too much dynamic range and ending up with blown highlights. So technique number one is to expose for the highlights and recover the areas in shadow in processing. This is when part of the photo is just too bright, like the sky, and if you expose the subject properly, you'll blow that part of the photo out. This was the case here as there was no road to get to the other side of these elephants, so I had to shoot them backlit. I exposed the photos as to not have the highlights touch the right hand side of the histogram to avoid clipping. And these elephants were close. I shot this with a 17 to 40 lens at 40 millimeters. Now in processing, what do we do? I start with a crop that looks good, maybe putting the horizon on the lower thirds. Raising the shadows is the next obvious step. The subject is still a bit dark, so I'll raise the exposure a bit more, but lower the highlights to preserve the sky. The sky is just as important as the elephant in this photo, so let's get that looking good. In Lightroom, you can use masks to select the sky. And no, I don't replace skies in my photos, but they often need different processing treatment. If we raise the contrast, we get more pop and saturation. If I place a linear gradient on top and darken the top a bit more, that looks good. Now I like my foreground to transition from darker to lighter just a bit, so a linear gradient here and just darken the bottom. What next? My subject with no light on it looks a bit flat, with too little contrast. So select the subject and add some contrast and play with the lights and darks to show off the shapes and textures. A bit of vibrance and a touch of vignette and voila. Rescued this photo from the trash bin in five minutes. Here's the before and after. And by the way, for those of you who wonder why wildlife photographers shoot a thousand or two thousand photos in a day, look at this series. These elephants are on the move. And this looks okay, but the position of the elephant in the back isn't good as it's blocked by the larger one. But I keep shooting. Better, 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 then perfectly placed, not touching either the elephant nor the edge of the frame. That is the perfect composition. Then half a second later, it's too late. You shoot tons of exposures to get the one that's just right. They're free. Problem number two in harsh light that the colors, well, suck. The harsh light gives all the surfaces a bright sheen that just makes everything look desaturated and colorless. So technique number two is to display your photo in a way that disguises this. One is to go black and white, the other is to intentionally give the photo a desaturated look. But when to use which technique? My advice is that when your photo has great shapes or patterns or is very minimalistic, go black and white. Like this photo of zebras in front of Mount Kilimanjaro. When you have no color, make a photo that needs no color. 
or these giraffes where the color doesn't make the photo, but rather the composition made by the patterns of the trees and giraffes and the nice clouds. Here's another one of this lioness where the bright sun was sapping out the colors. So I darkened the clouds and added contrast and clarity to make them look angry, then desaturated. That's right, move the vibrancy slider left, making the scene look more dramatic by emphasizing the background and the sense of place and giving the photo a more unique look. This is a good time to thank the sponsor of this video, Squarespace. If you're going to make images like we're discussing in this video, they deserve to be shown off in the most flattering way possible. A website is just a great way to show off all of the details in an image and show your photos the respect they deserve given how much work you put into them. Social media are often showing your images in small thumbnails and recently not showing them to as many people as they focus more on video. Your images deserve better. A permanent home presented in galleries that show them off at their best. I built my own website using Squarespace and it was easy. Lots of useful templates, including ones for specific genres like photography. Or if you're more daring and artistic, you can go outside the templates using all kinds of tools that will allow you to place video, photos, text, and links. It's also a great way to monetize your work by setting up an online store so you can take payments by credit card or PayPal from all over the world. You can even build engagement with your followers by offering them a free download in return for signing up to your email list. Go to squarespace.com to sign up for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash Simon for 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. While I was in Kenya, the kind folks at Canon had hooked me up with a new RF 200 to 800 millimeter lens to try out, and people have been asking me for my impressions. I found the image stabilization to be solid and the focus responsive, although I didn't shoot tons of birds in flight with it. Folks ask a lot about sharpness and I say it's good. If you look at this orange-bellied parrot shot wide open at f9 and zoom up to 50%, you can see a good amount of detail. At 100%, you're pushing it a little. But keep in mind that if the bird was this small at 800 millimeters, it was far away, maybe 40 or 50 meters. And my 45 megapixel R5 crops in a lot at 100%. And here by shooting stop down a little to f11, you can indeed see some increase in the sharpness. So this lens is at its best at f10 or f11 in my experience. And many may say, yes, but I always crop in a lot and I want my lens to handle deep crops and still be tack sharp. Two observations. One, with this lens, you don't need to crop in as much as you have tons of focal length. And two, this isn't an L lens. It's under $2,000 US and it appears to me to be the best value way to get to 800 millimeters. Shooting at shorter focal lengths was very solid. Here's a 100% crop at 311 millimeters, solidly sharp. And of course, the benefit of a wide zoom, here's 539 millimeters to reframe the shot. Again, solid. What about F9 for smoothing out that background, a desired trait in many lenses? I'd say it's still very, very good. Depth of field is affected by both aperture and focal length. So that 800 millimeter really smooths out that background. Here's the 200 to 800 on the left and my RF 600 millimeter F4 on the right. The 600 F4 is the bokeh king, of course, but the background on the 200 to 800 millimeter at F11 is still very smooth. And to give you a sense how much reach this lens has, here's 200 millimeters versus 800 millimeters on the same subject from the same distance. Crazy reach. And finally, low light. Is F9 at 800 millimeters a deal breaker? Well, in the rain, in the early morning with a gray sky for this line, I was indeed at ISO 5000 with only 320th of a second. So this leaves two options. One, temper your expectations in low light as your ISO will be high, especially with a crop sensor. It will work for sure, but higher ISOs will be common. Two, this would pair very well with a full frame camera. Why? One, because the weakness of full frame for wildlife is reach, and this has tons. And secondly, a full frame will handle the ISOs better. So this lens on an R8 or an R6 would be a great combo, actually. In short, a very versatile lens, very good quality, and well-priced. The next technique for bright light is get out of it. Get into the shade. Now in Ambicelli or the Maasai Mara, there's not a lot of shade to be found, but there is a bit under the acacia trees where the big cats sleep. Finding them under that shade is your friend. But in Samburu, shade wasn't hard to find as there are lots of trees there and big hills all around the valleys there. Now here's a red-billed hornbill, you know Zaza from The Lion King, in the full bright sun. While I could probably salvage something from this photo, those bright whites don't make this visually appealing to me. But notice the dark background? 
That's from a very tall hill, and just a few minutes later in the late afternoon, we were in the shade of it when we spotted another hornbill, who had just caught a praying mantis. Well, you know me, shoot, 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 and voila, pick the best pose amongst them. I often get asked, how do I choose? The one where the bird is slightly facing me, with the beak wide open, and the prey is between the open mandibles, and on a side angle, where it's clear it's a praying mantis. And 200 meters from there, I would have been in full sun with a washed out photo. The shade is your friend on a bright sunny afternoon. And here note one of my favorite effects. Subject in the shade, background in the sun. I actually seek out this look when I see something in the shade. I try to see if I can put a sunny background behind it. My next technique for when it's too bright out is shooting the shady side of your subject. It may be dark on the shady side, but it's better in most situations than the overly bright side. These elephants were out in the bright sun and we were on the shady side, and I didn't feel like shooting a silhouette, so I used my 600 millimeter lens and shot some detail shots, like the trunk and the tusks. I kind of like this one, catching the elephant shaking off the dirt from the grasses before eating them. Or these giraffes, where the shapes and outlines created by the subjects are what's more important than the details of the subjects themselves. Now, one of the biggest problems with a bright sun is that it can create a bright haze in the sky and background if there's a lot of dust or humidity in the air. I traveled halfway around the world to get to Ambazelli National Park, and one of the must-get shots for me was of elephants in front of Mount Kilimanjaro, which is easier said than done. First, often the top of Kilimanjaro is often covered in cloud cover. Two, you actually need to find elephants that happen to be between you and the mountain. And since you have to shoot at 70 or 80 millimeters to get the whole mountain in the shot, the elephants have to be quite close to you as to not appear to be tiny specks in your photo. I was never able to get those conditions during the golden hour, but I did get it in midday. But with that hazy sky, this photo needs some rescuing. Let's start by making it level and cropping out this half elephant and random tail here. And here's the secret to getting that mountain to show through, the dehaze slider in Lightroom. But if we apply dehaze to the whole image, it doesn't look very good. Let's select the background with a select background mask. Then remove the land from that mask so only the sky and mountain are selected. Now with the dehaze slider, it can introduce some unwanted saturation, so I'll reduce the saturation. Next, I like my foreground a bit darker, raise the shadows to show off more detail on the elephant, a bit of a vignette, this spot looks extra hazy, so a radial filter with more dehaze. And finally, the colors aren't great, so I like the desaturated look on this photo. A bit cooler white balance and reduce the vibrance like I showed you earlier. And here's the before and after. See how much we've recovered Mount Kilimanjaro, which was important as I wanted that icon in the photo. If you thought this video deserving, give it a like and other photographers will get to see it too and improve their own skills in bright sun situations. And I hope you can use these tips the next time you go out in bright sun and get your own unique and amazing photos. I know you can do it.